Good morning, uh, Professor Thomas Sargent. Uh, also, good morning to uh, Mr. Lim Chion, uh, Chairman of the uh, Board of SKBI. Distinguished guests, students, colleagues, and members of the SMU community, uh, a very warm welcome also and a good morning from my side. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, to welcome today as a speaker in the public lecture series of the Simki Boon Institute for Financial Economics, Professor Thomas Sargent. As we all know, he won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome here. He's actually our third Nobel laureate that we have this year, after uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, uh, Frederick de, Prof President Frederick de Klerk, who spoke in the Ho Rihua Public Lecture Series in March, and Professor Paul Krugman, who won the 2008 Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, I know from these recent experiences that, uh, from a talk from somebody of the stature of Professor Sargent, uh, that we will have a lot of refreshing ideas, uh, and perhaps hopefully also some challenging questions from the audience, because that always put a bit of uh, spirit in the, in the presentation and the discussion. Um, Professor Sargent uh, graduated from the University of California in Berkeley, Berkeley and received a PhD from Harvard University. He has taught at Minnesota, uh, Chicago, Stanford, and New York University. And I understand he's now taking up a post in Asia for two years at Seoul National University. Uh, we all know in this room that he specializes in the study of macroeconomics, monetary economics, and time series economics, and is a highly regarded expert on the limits of fiscal, monetary, and political policy. Uh, many of you, including me, uh, know that he's the author of many significant books and articles, including the classic economic textbooks, Macroeconomic Theory and Dynamic Economic Theory. And I know when I walk around in the campus that I see many of our students carrying well-thumbed copies of these books uh, with them. Although his statistical insights are renowned, I know that among his students at New York University, where he holds the W.R. Berkeley professorship in economics and business, he's also respected just as much for his devotion and sensitivity as a tutor. That he puts so much stress on teaching as well as research is something that is very much in accord with the pedagog pedagogical approach that we have here at SMU. Professor Sargent received the Nobel Prize with Chris Sims, according to the citation, for their empirical research on cause and effect in the macroeconomy. He's a founder of the Rational Expectations Model and the Freshwater Economics Movement. The brilliantly simple insight, and that's probably the, the beauty of the work there, behind rational expe expectations is that people make decisions based on a reasonable mental model of the economy, and also, crucially, based on their understanding of the government's economic policies. This means that since consumers and investors adjust their behaviors whenever the government shifts policies, these policies rarely have that intended effect. So much the bad news for those among you who are here in policy making. Uh, it's an insight that revolutionized economics in the post-Keynesian era era, and it uh, continues to dominate economic thinking today. But today, Professor Sargent will talk about the distinction between risk and uncertainty and its influence on valuations and decisions, building on recent advances in ways of thinking about so-called Knightian uncertainty. The focus will be on how people do or should behave when they don't know enough to form unique probability distributions over random outcomes. I'm looking forward to this because, as it happens, I have myself dedicated some of my research work on uncertainty and risk, but then from a purely operational site. So I'm not an economist, I'm an uh, operations researcher. So I looked at it and I'm looking forward to learn a little bit more about your insights in that field of uncertainty and risk. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, I hope that you will be join me, that you will join me in putting your hands together to warmly welcome Professor Thomas Sargent. Thank you. So it's really nice to be here. So um, actually, I regard operations research as the, uh, the heart of economics. And um, like, like two, two actually of my favorite economists, great economists at Stanford, um, David Kreps and Daryl Duffy, they, they are giant economists. Their degrees are in operations research. Um, OK, so 
You mentioned rational expectations. I'll just, I'll just tell you, I mean, what the idea is. Um, I'm going to say something about it here, but it's just, I was in, um, I, I went to China just just once, and somebody, somebody asked me to explain rational expectations to them. And I go on and on, blah, 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 blah. The person scratches his head and says, oh, did you know there's an old uh, Chinese, an ancient Chinese proverb? It's the government has strategies, the people have counter strategies. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> that's the whole thing. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, um, just, just something I don't understand and I'm trying to figure out with some friends. So it's about rational expectations and model uncertainty. And um, I'll tell you what those, uh, those things are. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about uncertainty. And here's the outline of the talk. <clears throat> I'm going to only use words for a while in my hands. Um, and then later if I have time, I'll actually use some math. And I'll use, some math, I'll, I'll use a term that scares many economists. It shouldn't, but it scares them and other people. So I'll talk about it. OK, so uncertainty. So my uh, outline is, what is it? Why do we care? How do we represent it or describe it? How do we measure it? Who confronts it? How does it affect equilibrium concepts? I'm an economist. What it does do to the two things economists care about, quantities and prices. And then how does it affect the way we think about designing good government policies? So if I knew the answers to all these things, I'd be proud, but I don't. Okay, so I'm just going to go through. <clears throat> okay, so so what is it? It's I'm going to describe it as fear of model misspecification. Something may be going through your head. What does he mean by a model? You know what misspecification means? It means it's wrong. Okay, so what do I mean by a model? So, so uh, for me, a model is a stochastic process. You may not, my friend Neil Wallace does not like that definition. He's not here. This is my talk. <clears throat> so what I mean by a model is a probability distribution over a sequence. Okay, so here's the picture. There's one probability distribution over a single variable. Here's a probability distribution over a bivariate, and I just want you to think of a, a probability distribution over an entire sequence. That's what we mean by stochastic process. That's what I mean by a model. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to be a digression about rational expectations, which, if you're a macroeconomist, a finance economist, public finance economist, you work for Bernanke at the central bank, you use rational expectations. So to me, that means you're a communist. <laughs> so I'll tell you what I mean by that. So a rational expectations model, what's a model? It's a probability distribution over a sequence. By the way, I gave a class at uh, Stanford where this, uh, okay. At, at a, at a, I gave a class at a good university that I don't want to mention. Every day, and, and uh, many students didn't, okay. Every day at the beginning of class, I walked in and I said the following. A model is a probability distribution over a sequence. First, that's the first thing I said, every day. I put it on the midterm. What's a model? <laughs> okay, you should have seen the answers I got. <clears throat> okay, so a model is a probability distribution over a sequence. So a rational expectations model, it's a probability distribution, is shared by every agent inside the model because a rational expectations model has people, decision makers, inside the model who are making decisions, who are trying to figure out things about the future they're consuming and investing. So they have a model, a probability distribution over a sequence. A rational expectations model is shared by every agent inside the model. It's shared by nature or God. 
and it's shared by the econometrician. There's one model on the table, one probability distribution. Um, and that is, that is, that, uh, I'll call that communism of models. Um, it's complete sharing. It's, it's exploited heavily in finance, in econometrics. When you do rational expectations econometrics and you use the generalized method of moments, pioneered by Hansen, you exploit that. Um, because you equate 1 over t summation xt, xt prime, to e. And when you're doing that, 1 over t, that's nature generating that. You're, you're using laws of large numbers. You're using this communism. And that's giving a great deal of power. <clears throat> but one thing you'll note is the sharing with nature part precludes any concerns about model misspecification. There's a, okay, there's a presumption. Okay, just think about it. You can't talk about, you can't talk in a coherent way, at least, against, about your model being misspecified. Because as soon as you do that, um, you question the communism. Things fall apart. Okay. So, okay, so, but I'm going to put, I'm going to, okay, so the reason Lars Hansen and I got into um, concerns about model uncertainty is we fit, Lars and I fit rational expectations models, and we've been doing it for a long time. And we do likelihood ratio tests to see how well they do, and they often get blown out of the water. The data say there's something wrong with the model. So Lars and I have been concerned about model specification all the time. So is Lucas and Prescott. Like early on in like 1982, Bob Lucas came up to me and said, you and, you and Lars's, your and Lars's likelihood ratio tests are rejecting too many good models. I'm going to stop doing econometrics. I'm going to start doing calibration. So he said. Now he didn't say correct models. He said good models. So like he's raising the question about what do you do if, if the data say your model's misspecification? What's the next step? Okay. Another way to put this is my wife's not an economist. She claims to know no math. She's a daughter of a nuclear physicist. She has good genes. I came home one night. She, she said, what are you working on? Presuming I'm working on anything. I said, I'm working on um, trying to figure out how to make decisions when you don't trust your model. And she said, I'd be mighty cautious. <laughs> That's going to be the whole story I'm going to tell you about. OK. So here's where we go. So why do we care about uh, model misspecification? <clears throat> so there's two reasons. Uh, one is um, there's something called the Ellsberg experiments that make, um, that make something called the Savage axioms dubious. And I'm not going to talk about that. It's a great thing to talk about it, but it, we can talk about it the rest of the time. <clears throat> so there's Savage is the person who told you you should have a single model. Ellsberg did experiments to say, oh yeah? And if you, if you perform the Ellsberg experiment on yourself, it, it will disturb you. It, it will make you very upset and make you more sympathetic with what I'm going to talk about. But that's not the reason Lars and I got into this. That's the purest reason. The reason Lars and I got in it is if you actually estimate models econometrically, in the end, you'll find it statistically different, very difficult to distinguish alternative models from the sample size of the length that at least a macroeconomist has. Actually, so if you're a finance economist, it's also true for finance. So uh, uh, I just saw, so, so a, a famous thing that Black and Litterman coped with is it's very easy to estimate covariances if you're a finance person. It's very difficult to estimate mean returns, even if you have reams of data. Okay, so I'm going to emphasize the second reason. So now the question is, how do you represent model uncertainty? So the idea here is, um, what we're going to do it is we're going to describe a decision ma maker who doesn't have a single model. What's the model? <laughs> Don't disappoint me. It's a probability distribution over a sequence. So what, what this decision maker is going to have is he's going to have a set of models. 
Okay, now my conscience comes in the room. Chris, uh, it would be Chris Sims. Um, and he would say, well, wait a minute, if you have a set of models, or, or Mr. Bayes, or Savage, they would say, oh, you have a set of models? No problem. Give me a probability distribution over the set of models. It's now a compound lottery, and I'll make it a single model. So if you can put a probability distribution over the set of models, you have a single model. But then I would say to Chris, um, and, and Chris would say, that's what, Chris Sims would say, that's what any intelligent person could do. I'm, not, I'm gonna disagree with him. Because if he says, um, give me a probability distribution over a set of models, I'll say, I'll give you a set of probability distributions over a set of models. And then we'll just keep talking forever. So what, a, what my guy's gonna do is he's gonna refuse to, he's gonna refuse to um, give in to the Bayesian imperialism of reducing everything to a, um, a single model. When I say I don't trust my model, I mean it. I don't have a single model, I have a set of models. So that's how we're gonna represent it, a set of models. And what Lars and I are actually, okay, good. So I don't wanna scare you early. So I'm gonna have a set of models. So now, if I have a set of models, how do I make um, a decision? So what, here's what I want. Okay, I use, in class I use something, it's, uh, this operator has not caught on. I'm the only one who ever uses it. Because it's, it's not mathematically well defined. It's called the want operator. Want, W-A-N-T. So here's what I want. I want a decision that's optimal for all, no matter what the statistical model governing the data is. And actually, the Bible says, seek and ye shall find. But actually, there's a footnote that don't seek too much. So this want operator, you can't do it. You, can't, you can have a model, you can have a decision that's optimal for one mo model. What's a model? Probability distribution. Thing. But it'll be op it won't be optimal for nearby models. So I give up on optimality. What I want is a decision that's good enough for the entire set of models. That's what I want. I want a decision that's robust. That's what my wife saw when she said be cautious. I want a decision that's gonna be good enough even if I'm wrong about my model's wrong. If my, and so the, this want operator about how greedy you can be is gonna come back in the picture. Okay, okay. So how do we manage? Well, this is it. How do we manage decisions if we're gonna make, um, if we're gonna act as if we have a set of models? The idea is, okay, this is what my friend Lars Hansen has done for a big part of his career. He wants, and actually this is what non-parametric statistics, what, what do you call it, semi-parametric statistics does. I want to construct bounds on value functions. I want to get valuations um, that are correct for, that are gonna give me estimates of values no matter what probability distribution within this set prevails. I want cautious evaluations. So you can think of expected utility. So think about expected utility. So an expected utility guy, and uh, you either teach that or study it, he has a single model, single probability distribution. What, is he, what do you do if he has a whole bunch of models in his head and he refuses to have a single model? So what my guy is gonna do is con construct a bunch of expected utilities and try to make decisions that let them sur surpass bounds on expected utility that are gonna prevail no matter what his model is. So if I have sets, I'm gonna have, I, I'm, the only way I'm gonna make progress is with bounds. That's the idea. <clears throat> so our tool const for constructing bounds is, there's gonna be a point at which you're gonna think I'm paranoid when I do this, but it's not really paranoia. Our tool for constructing bounds on value functions, we're gonna use min-max expected utility theory. This is actually classic, Wald used this. And Savage, actually, if you read Savage's book, which you should sometime, his whole book is about uh, turning your back on min-max expected utility, but half the book's about it. So, our tool for constructing bounds is gonna be min-max expected utility. There's gonna be a two-player game. 
Okay, and it's going to be like this. There's, you're the maximizing player. You want to maximize expected utility. But there's a minimizing player called the evil alter ego or the evil, uh, evil agent. Lars calls it the evil agent. He's, he's been to too many movies. But the idea is the minimizing player, he looks at your decision and he tries to choose a probability distribution which is going to minimize your expected utility given your decision. You want to maximize it. The reason that evil agent is really your friend is, look, look, what, he, look what he's doing. I'm going to say, I'm going to use this decision rule, which would be great if my model were correct. And what the minimizing agent says, okay, you use that decision rule, I'm going to pick this, prob this probability distribution. Now it's not going to do so well. So now I'm going to go to a Nash equilibrium. So I'm going to say, if you're going to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to modify my rule. Evil agent says, oh, if you do that, I'm going to do this. And now, now we go, we keep iterating, and we, get, we go to a Nash equilibrium. At the Nash equilibrium, I'm playing a best response against that worst case model. And by doing that, I'm attaining this bound. That's the whole idea. I don't know if you've ever been in the Army. I think that's what we did. Like when we're, like in, inf you know, in infantry school. Okay, so, you know, it's my job, I'm a, I'm a company commander. It's my job to defend this hill, you know, this little valley. I got 150 guys working for me. And then I look at the hill and I say, oh, if the guys, if the enemy is going to come through, it's going to come through right there. That's my expected, you, you know, it's going to come through there. And then my lieutenant says, um, oh, that, and I'm going to put all my guys there and then um, we're going to be ready for them. And my, um, my, because uh, that's my model. And my, uh, Lieutenant says, well, yes, that'll work if there, but look over there behind us. Uh, I said, oh, it's really hard to get through there. They're not going to come through there. They're probably not going to come through there. And he um, says, well, well, just a worst case analysis. So in the Army, you're always doing that. You're always putting multiple models into it. Just by being cautious. Okay. So how do we measure it? Okay, I told you I was going to scare you. Relative entropy. Many of us became economists because um, we hated high school physics. And we hated the second law of thermodynamics and um, entropy. And we, w we never wanted to see it again. And now, today, you're seeing it. OK, so what relative, relative entropy is, it's the unexpected log likelihood ratio. That's all it is. A likelihood ratio is the ratio of two models. I told you, a model is a probability density over a sequence. So a likelihood ratio is a ratio of two models. I'm going to take its log. It's got to be non-negative. And now I'm going to take the expected value of that using what distribution? I have two models. I, got, I have a choice. I can use one or another. I'm going to pick one of them. And that expected log likelihood ratio is a measure of it's actually a measure of how difficult it is statistically to distinguish the two models. Econometricians see that all the time. That's used in likelihood ratio tests or in Bayesian model selection tests. So what this does technically, it bounds rates of statistical learning as sample sizes grow. And there's a whole beautiful theory, you should learn it sometime, called large deviations theory, which is all about this. It works like magic. Okay, so entropy. If, if you are distressed by me using that term, you're not alone. So look at this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. When Shannon invented his quantity, didn't know what to call it. Shannon is the person who invented information theory. He consulted von Neumann, who was hanging around the same place, John von Neumann, on what to call it. Von Neumann replied, call it entropy. It's already in use under that name, and besides, it will give you a great advantage in debates because nobody knows what entropy is anyway. <laughs> in my experience with macroeconomists, you know, it's like, I don't know. We're, we're kind of a lower species of economists, we are, but entropy cite, cite, you know, cites, it gives, it just gives terror in their eyes. Okay, so what we're going to use, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a model. Okay, so, so the, the conversation goes like this. Lars and I invent a model. 
We take it to Bernanke. This happens daily in the Fed. Have a model. People work really hard to estimate the model. They take the model to Bernanke, and um, it's a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. It's one model. Bernanke says, do you trust it? Guarantee me it's correct. They say, well, what do you mean by a model? Bernanke says, you dope. It's a probability distribution over a sequence. <laughs> okay. So then, so then they, they say, no, it's, it's a good model. It's a good approximation. Discussion goes like this. I think it's a good approximation. Prescott always says this all the time. Good approximation. And then Bernanke says, to what? Now the guy says, uh, well, if I knew that, I would have written down that model and brought you that. So it's a good model, it's a good approximation to a model you can't describe. So Bernanke presses him more. What do you mean by good approximation? Well, I think the relative entropy is not too big. And, and this model might be statistically hard to distinguish from the real model that's generating the data. So now the, now the deal is, here's the vision, abstract space. There's my model of point. I'm going to put a ball around it. It's an entropy ball. I'm going to make the entropy, I'm going to make the entropy ball so that um, it's big enough so every model in there, now that's a huge set of models. It's uncountable. Um, all, all absolutely continuous probability distributions with respect to my model are in there. V very hard to distinguish. Um, and, 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 and the guy talking to Bernanke said, it could be one of those. That's the deal. And then what Bernanke's going to want to do is, and Bernanke's written about this, he's going to want to make decisions. Um, actually, if you think about QE3 and things, he's going to want to make decisions that are correct, not at just if this model, that, that are good, not only if this model rules the data, but if one of these. So that's how. So now the question is, who confronts it? So who confronts, model, fear, of mo who confronts fear of model misspecification? So think hard about that. So I'm going to say everybody. So I'm going to say we the model builders do on a daily basis. But now here's the thing, because I'm a rational expectations person, so do the agents inside our models. Okay, so now I tell you, okay, I gave a talk, a bad talk about this kind of stuff. Bob Lucas was in the audience. He came up to me afterwards and he said, why do the agents in the model have to be like us? And what I said, you know, what I said to him, you, you, Bob Lucas and I do not get to say that. Because if you go back to the beginning, because we're old, if you go back to the beginning of rational expectations, where did it start? It started with John Muth saying, criticizing models in which people had adaptive expectations, and there was a discrepancy between the predictions that the model builder was making and the agents inside the model. And, and what Muth literally says is, we should put the agents on the same footing as ourselves as statistical forecasters. And you know, that's what, that is, you know, so when Lucas and I were kids, nobody knew how to do that. We didn't know how to do that in, in comprehensive, in models, like macro models. And Lucas is famous because he's the first guy to figure that out. And it was hard. Because we didn't know what fixed point theorems were properly. We didn't really know. And, um, so, Lucas doesn't get to say that. So, like if, like if I, if I, say that we, we as model builders confront this problem, it's very likely that the agents inside our model do too. And I'm going to come back to that. So, so that's largely my line. We haven't convinced Lucas. So I'm going to say private agents confront it. I'm going to say government policymakers confront it. Okay, so this is going to call, cause all hell to break loose. Um, okay. So in the following sense, if you're a macroeconomist or a finance economist, um, how are you going to, how are you going to, 
see, the beautiful thing about rational expectations was um, the probability distribution that I talked about, rational expectations equilibrium, is a probability distribution that's endogenous. You're determining it as a fixed point because people's beliefs influence outcomes. So you gotta, that, that's why it was hard to do. So we figured out how to do that, the recursive competitive equilibrium. You know, we took a map, so here's how we did it. Um, actually, this isn't how Lucas and Prescott did it because it was too, this didn't work out, but we figured out how to do it afterwards. You take, you take a mapping. Here's what people believe. Those beliefs generate actual outcomes. So you take a, a perceived probability distribution that people believe, a perceived model, that gives rise to an actual model that generates the data. They generally won't be even, equal. So there's a mapping from perceived models in people's heads to actual models that are actually governing the data. Well, take that mapping and iterate on it. That's what Lucas and Prescott started. What they found it was explosive. But there's other ways to find a fixed point. So what a rational expectations equilibrium is, it's a fixed point in a mapping from a, a, a probability distribution that's in people's heads, a stochastic process, a model that's in people's head, to the actual model that's governing the data. Go get a fixed point. Okay. So now what do I do if people have sets of models? So here's what Lars and I do. We're, we're ruthless. Okay, we want to stick as close as possible to rational expectations. So our deal is we're going to do that same kind of mapping. So it's every, all of us in this room fear model misspecification. We have different interests. We have different interests. But the deal is we're going to largely going to assume we all share this common approximating model. And there's this entropy ball around it. So we all share the common model. And we all have this set of models. But we're going to do different things. We're going to make different decisions. So Lars and I are going to restrict where the equilibrium concept is going to mimic the rational expectations, but what's going to be determined is the center of this ball. That's arcane. So what it is is if you do it this way, there's an extension of a Nash or subgame perfect equilibrium, a self-confirming equilibrium, or a recursive competitive equilibrium. So we know how to do this. This isn't, only, this isn't the only way to do it, but if you have multi-agent setups where, where people have sets of models, you're going to have to confront this. And this is only beginning to be a frontier in finance. Okay. So notice what happens. So if you and I share a common approximating model, but we have, we have different, we have this ball around it, and you do max min expected utility and, and I do it, then what happens is ex post, my minimizing probability distribution, and that's the, that's the probability distribution that rationalizes my decisions. Because when I'm doing a zero-sum two-player game, I'm playing a best response against my worst-case beliefs. That's my tool for getting a robust rule. You're doing the same, but you have different interests than I do. What's going to happen is you're going to have a different worst-case model. So now somebody's going to come, somebody's going to come, around, come along, and they're going to see is it looks like we have belief heterogeneity. This is a machine for generating endogenously belief heterogeneity, or what looks like belief heterogeneity. And there's some observational equivalences that come here. Ex post, a researcher could come in and um, build a model with heterogeneous beliefs that would reproduce the data that we get. Um, it would be a superficial model. Anyway, so that's what happens. So this turns out to be a, a discipline model of belief heterogeneity. The reason I mention this is, um, Especially since the financial crisis, but for other reasons too, there's a wave of, there's a wave of research. Gina Coppolis has done it, Bloom and Easley, other people. Um, goes back to Harrison and Krebs in a beautiful paper. 